Hi, I'm Buddy Machini, the CTO of Airware. I'm very lucky to have with me today Professor Eric Johnson. He's the Lockheed Martin Associate Professor of Avionics Integration at the School of Aerospace Engineering at Georgia Tech. He's also the director of the UAV Research Facility at Georgia Tech. He's an aerospace engineer, an instrument rated pilot, many other things. Eric, thanks very much for coming out today. Oh, thanks for having me. So, as the head of the UAV Research Facility, you have directed a lot of cutting edge research in UAV technology. What would you say is sort of the overall theme of the research that you do at your lab? Guidance, navigation, control of, of unmanned aircraft is the thing we're most known for. And I think one of the things that sort of unified our work is we're interested in, in making the systems uh, that are out there, making them safer, making them more reliable, and making them do have new types of capabilities. So let's get right down to the nerdy brass tacks and talk about some of the research projects. Okay. Um, one that's near and dear to my heart, adaptive and fault tolerant flight control. Um, at a high level, what is adaptive control? Adaptive control is a variant of flight control, and of course, just you know, flight control in general, that's about, all about steering the aircraft to make it go where you want it to go. And when you add adaptation into it, you're actually making it so the system can respond differently over time. So it, it actually, in fact, sometimes it's called learning control. It actually learns from past experience to behave differently in the future. And one of the main reasons you might do that is you, if uh, the vehicle were to have some sort of fault or change its behavior, you'd like the control system to respond differently. So what is an example of where an adaptive controller or a fault tolerant controller would make a commercial UAV more robust? Simplest example would be an engine failure. Uh, some payload shifts or an aerodynamic shape changes which causes the, the vehicle to behave in a different way. If you want to maintain uh, acceptable performance in terms of you know, getting it where you want it, where you want it to go, uh, adaptive control may be helpful. And what are some of the, the most like, extreme cases of failures that you've seen handled well by adaptive control? Um, we did one case where we had an airplane and had 50% or half of one wing uh, fall off in flight intentionally and had the vehicle respond uh, correctly to that f fault, and get, giving no direct knowledge to the onboard systems that that fault had taken place. And having it uh, correctly respond uh, to that uh, failure by using the remaining controls that are left over to deal with the extreme change in how the vehicle behaves with most of the wing missing. When the wing falls off, aileron and all? Yeah, the whole aerodynamic uh, capability of uh, that uh, wing, uh, the control capability gone. Uh, that's one. Another one I would highlight too, which is, which is rather interesting, is uh, on a helicopter, you can change the thrust of that rotor, but you can also change the direction of the, the thrust, and that's the primary means of maneuvering the aircraft. And you can actually postulate failure cases where you can actually lose partial capability in there. So you can only turn in certain directions. And uh, we, we came up with a, a system a number of years ago which, which could respond to such a partial failure uh, by uh, in also using the RPM of the rotor, changing how fast at revolutions per minute, how fast that rotor changes as an alternate means of adjusting the thrust and then, and then using that capability to uh, regain roll and pitch control as well and uh, actually uh, simulated uh, c continuing uh, uh, flying closed loop control of a helicopter with that partial failure. Seems like a pretty creative way to, you know, to continue to maintain control. Is this completely automatic? Is this you know, determined by the flight control system or is there a human somewhere who's you know, guiding the system? Um, in those examples I brought up, those were um, automated responses. So we were attempting to have uh, uh, onboard automation dealing with that uh, fault uh, completely wow. without, without human intervention. So what, uh, what types of vehicles have you applied adaptive and fault tolerant controllers to? Uh, we've done airplanes, we've done uh, helicopters, uh, we've done uh, multi-rotors, and uh, we've done uh, some other even more creative uh, configurations, um, such as a uh, ducted fan configuration. Adaptive control has seen a lot of you know, research over the years. In, in your opinion, is adaptive control mature enough to be used on a commercial aircraft system? In my opinion, it absolutely is. Yeah, it's, uh, I've been, uh, in, within my lab, we've used it for 15 years. Uh, we've uh, directly seen the benefits for us because we can put different, different uh, uh, payloads on our, on our systems and we don't have to spend uh, time uh, tuning that. And uh, we've been very pleased with the results. So next topic, uh, vision-based guidance, navigation, and control. Again, at a high level, what is it? Why is it important? Uh, the basic idea would be to use, use a camera, to, to put a camera on board and make use of the tremendous amount of information that you can get from the visual scene and use that in their variety, variety of potential uh, guidance control problems. This is, in, in many ways, this is biologically inspired because uh, we as humans get tremendous benefit from our sight to allow us to move around in the same way with birds and so on. And, it, and so many of this, those same uh, capabilities are inspired uh, 
from there. And, and, and again, what are, what are some of the failure modes that you know standard systems without visual augmentation, you know, might encounter that the vision would help? Uh, some of the most interesting would be a, a typical unmanned system today would rely on a global positioning system or GPS, so satellite-based navigation. In, and uh, to the extent that that system could potentially uh, fail, uh, this vision-based system could uh, potentially be a backup to that. Uh, another is uh, the potential uh, obstacle avoidance advantage. This is a, a way of sensing that there's an obstacle uh, in the path that uh, prevents a, presents a hazard. This is often referred to as the scene avoid technology. Uh, yeah, both, a, a, uh, both potentially fixed ground obstacles, but as well as potentially other aircraft. Yeah, the, the, exactly, the sense and avoid problem. And, where, and then I guess that, that starts to become important when you start integrating UAVs into airspace that also has manned aircraft. Mm -hmm. That's right. So what is the progression of a research project from when it starts in the lab all the way through to when it may be applied to a commercial product? And, and maybe what are some of the obstacles along the way? It can take a variety of paths, and it, it's uh, very hard to predict ahead of time how, how that might go. But uh, you know, very often we receive uh, research funding, and we'll, or uh, perhaps we'll do some work toward uh, one of the competitions we're working on or something, and we'll develop a capability over time. Uh, what can happen is that, uh, that might, uh, we might just write a paper on it, it gets published, and others may adopt it. Um, it may, we may seek a, a patent or a, a license uh, agreement, which uh, potentially could be licensed by a, by a commercial entity, which might then uh, transition, uh, transition that, uh, that, con that technology. Into and the are, field. are there some sort of aspects of the technology that you, know, you have to sort of develop to make it more amenable to you know, use on a, on a sort of commercial system? Uh, absolutely. And, I, and in fact, that's one of, the, one of the challenges transitioning academic work into, into the commercial realm is, is is the uh, the interest on the academic side of the of uh, publishing in papers or so and that basically gets you to a certain point but there's often quite a few uh, in t uh, details that, that, that come about that are much more mundane that are necessary to actually get it uh, into a commercial product and so that can be a bit of a gap that needs to get uh, hurdled sometimes are there any technologies you know related to unmanned systems that maybe are not in widespread use right now but you think will make a significant impact in the future one that i think uh that i'm particularly excited about is automatic obstacle avoidance uh, i think uh, there's a real potential safety improvement and uh, and uh, if if when you, if human tries to drive a vehicle uh into a tree or something that that vehicle would were, were to stop before it hit the tree on it all on its own um, i've actually flown that type of a capability uh, in our in our research flight testing, and it is very compelling and 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 special, and I I think that might be one that, that people will be pretty excited about. It seems like in with aerial systems, you can't just sort of pump on the brakes and, and come to a complete stop. There's some sort of advanced decision making that needs. That's to right. Happen. It has to anticipate that it's going to happen ahead of time and respond early. That's exactly right. How can developments in regulatory policy help propel your research? One thing that that uh, would might would be uh, interesting is if uh, we could have special uh, category for uh, research and education use of UAS. That's something that's, that's potentially very interesting. But I, actually, I'd like to turn that around a little bit. And I, I think there's a real opportunity also for our research to inform policy. I think that that's a, a real important area that, that uh, needs some attention uh, as far as uh, potentially assessing what we can do on the guidance navigation control technology in terms of performance, capabilities, and how that should affect regulations and policies going forward. So in the same way that research can inform policy and commercial drone development. Uh, what is the feedback in the other direction from you know, commercial drone deployment and operation to the research community? In academia, we, we, we're, something we're very interested in is those lessons learned, those requirements uh, that actually flow back from the potential applications of the technology. And this can really inform where we go in our, in our research in the future. Great. Thank you. Eric, it was a pleasure. Okay. Thank you very much for coming out. Professor Eric Johnson, director of the UAV Research Facility at Georgia Tech.